Oh, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and we are glad you are here to join us this morning. Uh, we are starting a series this morning called The Church, The Hope of the World. And so we're going to talk about what it means to be the church and what we are supposed to do and how we are supposed to live. And I remember growing up in a Christian home that we went to church every week. I mean, my dad was a children's pastor. That's why we moved up here in the first place. And so church was something we hardly ever missed. And so growing up, I figured church, this word meant something along the lines of, this is a place you go to, almost like a restaurant where you go to eat food. This is where you go to uh, talk about God and open up the Bible and sing some songs. And so there's this cultural understanding as well that a lot of us think of church in that way too, that we think of it's this, it's this physical place. But when we look at what the church actually is, when we go back to the Greek, it's kind of remarkable about what this word means. Uh, there's a, yeah, look at this slide. First, it starts out with this word ekklesia. That's, what they, that's the word that is used to translate over um, to English as church. Maybe okay, there's a couple steps in between. So this word ekklesia just means gathering. So right now we are a gathering of people. It's a very general term. It can mean like a gathering that's watching a play or a gathering that's watching a sporting event or uh, an angry mob. It's, I mean, it's a really general term for a gathering. So what they did to differentiate themselves, the early Christians, is they added the word kyrios, which means Lord. And so by doing that, by saying uh, kyrios ekklesia, they distinguished and said, this is a, this is the Lord's gathering. This is about the people of Jesus coming and gathering together to worship Jesus. Okay. And so eventually they dropped the word ekklesia, and then we get this word kirsch, which is Scottish. Okay, and it's like, it gets dropped into there, and then it's, this is the transliteration. So from Kyrios to Kirsch, and then finally over to what we know now as church. And so this is where the transition has kind of happened, that we now view church as this physical location instead of this assembly of people who are gathering together to praise the name of Jesus. And truly, we get this all messed up because our ways of thinking, uh, we tend to, this is, this is a cultural thing. We tend to view places as the things in of themselves. And so what we need to do as the church is to understand what we really are, that we're a gathering of people who believe in Jesus. When we use this term church, I want you to think of it like this over the next five weeks. The term church is God's body of people throughout the entire world who profess faith in Jesus Christ. That is what we mean when we refer to the church. And so when we talk about Portland Community Church, we are the local expression of that gathering of people who worship Jesus. And so the New Testament writers use all kinds of metaphors to describe what the church is and what it was supposed to be like and do. And one of those is called the royal priesthood, which is what we will talk about today. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to learn about what this term means and what this means for us to how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to act out as the church. Uh, and so we're going to look at four directives on what it means means to be the royal priesthood of God. So as you turn there, 1 Peter 2, if you do not have a Bible with you, you can grab one of the hardcover brown Bibles uh, in the seat in front of you, and then you can open up to page 1221 so that you can follow along and see. Uh, it's also going to be on the screen, but also you can have it in front of you as well. And this passage, just to let you know while you turn there, is a series in a set about how the Old Testament people of God, the nation of Israel, relates and applies to the New Testament church uh, and the people of God now. And so what Peter was writing about, he was doing a lot of writing about the fact that this was, you know, they were going through this really intense persecution. This letter was supposed to go out to many different churches in order to encourage them to hold, to stand firm in the midst of this persecution under the emperor Nero. And so Keep that in mind as we read this passage this morning. So let's go ahead. I'm going to read uh, verse 1, and that might bring up a little bit of terror in you that my first point is going to be just on one verse. Don't worry, it's not a 10-point sermon, all right? We'll, we'll finish within the time that's allotted for us this morning. So it's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. 
A little bit of a tip when you are studying the Bible for yourself is when you see the word therefore, you ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? So this little trip I, trick I actually heard uh, growing up in Sunday school at, at, my, at my church's uh, Sunday school class, high school class. And, and so what Peter did right before is he talked about how the Christians, the church, the body of Christ is to love one another as Christ has loved us. And so that is what we are called to do. We are called to love one another. And so therefore, he says, because you are to love one another, you are to rid yourselves of these attitudes. These, there are five attitudes and sins that he lists here. And they're all very divisive and can destroy a church. And what he's saying by rid yourselves of, this, of these kinds of things is you are casting out your old life, that this is who you used to be, and instead you are putting on a whole new life in Christ. And so that's actually our first directive for this morning is that we rid ourselves of our old way of living. It's not that we get to hold on to little pieces of our old self and say, okay, God, I'll let you have, I'll let you have everything else, but not this little part right here because I want this. This is for me. This is what I want to do. No, we give all of it up to God and we cast aside everything else of who we used to be. And this is a very gospel-centered idea that we cast it aside. We, you know, when Christ was on the cross and he died for our sins, he took on our sins, he took on our old selves. And when he was buried in the grave after he had died, our sins stayed there with him when he raised from the dead. So our old selves are dead and buried with him. Paul even says this in Galatians 2.20, for I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So this is a gospel story. We have been, we have been, our old selves have been crucified, are dead and buried, and now we live into a new life. And so to be a royal priesthood of God, we are to cast out the old ways of living. And when we look at these five sins or these five attitudes, I want to get into what these, what these things are. When we look at malice, this is a wicked ill will towards someone. So this is, about, and specifically he's talking about, you know, not to do this as brothers and sisters in Christ, but this would be a, you know, this is still good to do to people outside the church as well, but he's specifically referring to people in the church, to have a ill will towards someone, just this wicked feeling of hatred towards another person, or it's a deceit to be deliberately dishonest about yourself, about them, about whatever. Hypocrisy, to have this veneer of righteousness that you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you know something isn't right. Or to act in love, but really you have an attitude of hatred towards a person. Or there's envy, that you have a resentful discontentment towards someone, that you look at them and there is resentment and there's discontent about who they are and what they're like, and, then, and that you want part of their lives. And lastly, slander, that you are specifically talking about them behind their back to their face to demean and devalue their character to tear them down. These are all things that Peter is saying, this is not to be a part of the church. And I've truly, unfortunately, seen this in a church and how this can absolutely destroy a church when people act like this towards each other. It can destroy us. And one of the things I want, you, want to encourage you with is in the almost two years I've been here, I have yet to really see that in our church. I have yet to really see those five things. But that's not necessarily something we stand back and, okay, pat, on our, pat our backs and say, good job, church, we're doing a good job. But it's to say we need to continue to be vigilant and not let those kinds of ideas and sins and attitudes enter into our body, into our church, because that can destroy us. It is, these ideas are not to be mentioned amongst any church whatsoever, but unfortunately that is named among far too many Christians around the world. And so let's strive not to be that way. So next Peter continues and he says, look at verse two, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter gives a very vivid picture for those of us who have uh, had newborns in our home. So if you're a parent and you've had a newborn, uh, you, you know what this means. Like a newborn baby, crave pure spiritual milk. When a newborn is the first arrives on this earth, they are insatiable with their milk. They need it. And I remember when Avery was first born, we had to create this, uh, this routine in order for us to be sane about dealing with a newborn of, you know, sleeping, Eating, changing, sleeping, eating, changing, however that order worked out. That, and, and it happened every three hours. We'd have to 
change her. We'd have to feed her and we'd have to put her back to sleep every three hours. That's, I mean, this is, it's a crazy cycle that these little newborns go for. But when they cry, they cry because they're hungry. They're starving. They want to eat and they crave it. They desire it so bad that they must have it right now. And you can't walk up to a newborn and start to try and rationalize and talk to them and say, now, I couldn't do this as a parent. I couldn't have said this to Avery when she was first born. Now, Avery, mommy's really tired. You've already fed, you've already ate from her six times today. Like, you're gonna be okay for another 10 minutes if you let her sleep. It's gonna be okay. But no, Avery instead would continue what we called her angry cry when she got really hungry. And it actually sounded like she was praising Allah. It was really funny. She'd be like, Allah, Allah, Allah. <laughs> and she just would cry and just we couldn't get her to stop. But what Peter is saying here is this incredible picture that we, as even as adults, are to crave God and his word just as much as a newborn craves its milk. So that's our second directive, that we crave the word of God as essential nourishment. And that pure spiritual milk, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the word. That's what, that's what milk, this idea of pure spiritual milk kind of comes across the rest of the New Testament, that it's the word of God. But look at, he also says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, that you have tasted and gotten to know God and seen how good and wonderful and perfect and marvelous he is, that you taste it and that's what you long for. And so our job as a royal priesthood is to crave God and his word. And if we're honest and we can all take inventory at this, we can all look at ourselves and say, you know, there are definite times where I don't crave God like that, where I'm so focused on every other thing besides him that we lose sight of craving him, craving his word. I want you to do this as a little bit of a litmus test. Think of about five things that you enjoy in your life that is not, that's like easy for you to enjoy, that you, that you love. Like it could be being with your family. It could be eating delicious food. It could be your job if you're really that kind of person, which is okay. Uh, you could also... You know, it could be going for a long drive or going on a road trip. Things like that that you think about and you say, I genuinely love this and enjoy this. How many of you would immediately list something about studying God's word and taking time to get to know God? Or does that sound like a, a, you know, another task, another chore, another thing to do? Here's the thing. I want to encourage you with this. To crave God and to enjoy him is actually what you were designed for. I want to show you something from what's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's talking about man's chief purpose, man's chief end. This is what it says. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It's this beautiful idea, and this is a biblical idea. This is something that they put together by looking at the Bible and putting it on and, and find, like basically summarizing what man's purpose here is to do. So first is to glorify God, to give him praise for everything that he's doing and to tell him how great and wonderful he is, to thank him for who he is because he is worthy of praise because of his great love for us. And then secondly, to enjoy him, to genuinely enjoy who he is, to enter into a relationship with him and enjoy what you find in him. It's this amazing thing. This is what we were designed to do. We often, we get so confused by giving ourselves into so many other things that we forget that we were designed to know God and enjoy him. And truly, here's why I want to encourage you with this morning. If you are sitting there being honest and taking inventory of yourself and saying, you know what? I don't think I really actually enjoy God. I think that's something for me that's really hard. There's always hope. That is something that you pray and you say, God, I want to view you this way. I want to crave you like a newborn craves its mother's milk. I want to enjoy you like you designed me to do. So God, show me what that means. Show me what that looks like. Because here's what we, here, let me just tell you a little bit of an example of my life. The more I've given myself to Jesus, the more I've grown in my relationship with him, the more and then the more I obey him, the more that I follow his commands and the more that I've learned that, man, I need to stop being so stubborn and just do what God tells me to do. The more that I genuinely actually find myself enjoying the life that God has given me. It's this incredible, beautiful thing that can happen. The more that I find myself enjoying God simply for who he is. And remember, this is what we were designed for, but I, I wanna show you something else with it. 
Look at Psalm, this is, it's gonna be on the screen, but look at Psalm one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but those who delight, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Now we think of law like this, you know, rigid set of rules and I don't know if anyone sits there and goes, you know, I really enjoy the laws of our country. I just delight in them. The, you could be weird like that, and you know, that, that's, that you're, that's fine, that's, that's good for you. But most people, we, we think of law, and we go, that, no. But law is about teaching, about God's ways that he has designed the world, the way that he has created you to live, that you and to delight in his word that he has given to us, to delight in it, to crave it, to love it, and meditate on it day and night. And look what it says, it says right in the beginning, blessed is the one who does that and who forsakes what the world has to offer and says, God, I'm going to pursue you and your word. I'm going to crave you and desire you. And for many of us, you know, this is a, a real thing. Sometimes it's hard for us to enjoy it because we don't understand. We might look down and read a page of scripture and just go, well, that was wonderful. I have no idea what it just said. Like there are, and, and a lot of people would be honest, they would look at some of the things in the Old Testament and just walk away scratching their head about it. Like, what did I just read? Let me give you a few little pieces of advice. Because we live in the age of the internet, there are an abundant amount of resources out there that basically spoon feed you ideas about the Bible to help you understand what it says. Uh, one I've referenced before, but I'm gonna reference it again because I love it so much. It's called The Bible Project. We actually went to their studio this week on Wednesday, and it was, it was pretty awesome, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, those who went. It was fantastic. Uh, the, the people there are super friendly and really nice, and we actually met the guys who like write it and, and, you know, and are the voices on the videos, and uh, that was also weird to like see that this was a real existing person, not just someone on a screen that I see all the time, okay? <laughs> but they, I mean, they spoon feed you. They have uh, outline descriptions of every single book of the Bible in animated form, every single book. So if you read, say, the book of uh, Lamentations and you're like, wow, Jeremiah was really sad. What does that mean? <laughs> you can look it up. It tells you all about it. You can look at it. So you can go to Bible Project, join the BibleProject.com. You can type in the Bible Project in YouTube or you want the, the most simple process possible, type in the Bible Project into Google, Okay. That's how you do it. Second place you can go to is this other place called the BibleStudyTools.com. And when you go there, it has commentaries. It has lots of free stuff so that, you know, if money is an issue, you don't even have to worry about it. It just, again, gives it to you. You can have it. But lastly, I, I, I would say also have a study Bible. Study Bibles are phenomenal. They have like a third of the page where it's actually from the scripture, like what the Bible, the Bible text, and then two thirds of it are notes, just telling you what it says. There's maps, there's outlines, there's descriptions what these books are about. There's history behind it, if you're a history buff like me. That, and so it, I'm telling you, these things, there's plenty of places for you to understand. So if you sit here and you go, I just don't understand it, that's why I have a hard time craving, there it is. There are some tools and tips for you to go out and to know it and to create and sin. As you learn, trust me, as you learn and as you grow, you will see and learn so much more about who God is, what he is like, and you will learn to love and crave him and his word. Okay, we're gonna continue, verse four. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And so Peter continues and he says this phrase, as you come to him. And the way this is phrased in the Greek is actually like a habitual, like continual, constant coming. A lot of times there's this mistaken thinking that, that people have about Christianity that it's this one time, like get out of jail free card or, or signing up for fire insurance that you simply just believe in Jesus and now you're good for the rest of your life. You're covered, you can go do what you want and everything's fine. 
That's not what Christianity is. It's a constant coming to God, coming to him, admitting your faults, admitting your sin, repenting of it and saying, I seek now to live the way that Christ would call me to live. It's a daily thing. Jesus even says it himself that we are to take up our cross daily and follow after him. Daily. So this is an everyday thing we wake up to. The gospel is not just this one-time commitment. It's an everyday reality that we now live in everything and we see through the lens of scripture. A lot of the New Testament writers write in that way where they're constantly pointing back to the gospel and reminding you, this is reminding us, this is how we are to live. So the gospel isn't just about a way out of hell. It's a way to know God and to be in a relationship with him. And so we come to him, we come to him, and this is Jesus, the living stone, the resurrected Jesus. He is alive, he is living. And so this stone, and Peter starts putting together this imagery of a builder, putting together a, a construction of a building. And this is, the, this is another description of the church, that we are being built together. And look at what he does. He, we, are, we are being built together with Christ, Christ, and then he says that Christ is the cornerstone. And it's beautiful for us to understand that, that we are being built up together with him. And there's a specific purpose that we are being built up together with him, and that is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are not just being put together to simply come to church once a week, but to be a building, a body of Christ, a temple of God that is devoted completely to worshiping and glorifying him. And that's for each and every individual person. The purpose of the church, like Peter is showing us here, is not simply just to meet and, uh, and sing songs, but to live a life that is glorifying God to, together in order that we may give him glory and to offer sacrifices. And what are these sacrifices? It's not these Old Testament sacrifices where they had to like slaughter an animal. This is a sacrifice of yourself. Look at Romans 12. It's gonna be on the screen. Romans 12, one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I like that last phrase. This is your true and proper worship, that the way that we are supposed to worship is to offer up ourselves as the living sacrifices. And it's this beautiful idea that in, it, before we knew Christ, we were separated from him. And so we, and because of our sin and because of our depravity, we could not approach God in any way, shape, or form or be the sacrifice. There had to be another sacrifice in our place. And so Jesus did that for us. He offered up himself on the cross, died on the, on the cross for us, taking up our sin, taking up all of our brokenness so that, not just so that we could be forgiven, but so that we may be made righteousness, made, made into God's righteousness. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus, perfect, sinless, came to this earth and, and bore all of our sin on the cross so that we could become the righteousness of God. And then as a result, because we are now, if you are a follower of Christ, you are identified as righteous before God. That is your identity. You now can stand before him and offer up yourself as a living sacrifice. And you simply say to him, God, your will be done, not mine. God, I am offering myself to you to live in this way. Because what we often do is we, we categorize Christianity in this idea of it's, it's this religion that I believe in, that I think about in my head, that I trust in by saying, yes, I agree with those ideas that there was a Jesus and he came and died and all of that. But it's this, it's supposed to be this radical transformation that happens in a person's life when they put their lives upon Christ, when they offer up their lives to God because of what Jesus did. And, what it, and the whole idea of what Jesus did is this idea of the chosen and precious cornerstone. That Jesus himself is that cornerstone. I looked up what a cornerstone is. It's this ancient building practice where they would put it down and it basically set the edges for the rest of the building. Kind of set and put it in place of how it was going to be put together. Dictated the uh, structure of the building. And so having a solid cornerstone enabled the building to have a solid foundation and to be able to grow and to be built. And so that's actually our third directive is that we view Christ as the foundation for everything in our lives. Because what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to compartmentalize our life and to say, oh, well, this is, what, this is my work life. This is my home life. This is my entertainment life. This is my marriage life. This is 
all of that, we, we tend to mix, just compartmentalize like a waffle, okay, where we put it all in the different spots, and here's the thing, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life isn't simply having all those different areas, but that Christ is the foundation and ruler of every single thing and area in our lives. And we say, there's not an area in our life where Christ doesn't want to be the ruler over and say, I am in charge. I want you to rule. I want to rule in your life. P the Apostle Paul even puts it this way in Philippians 1, Philippians 121. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Grammatically, that sounds really weird to put it that way. But what he's saying is, my life is defined by Jesus himself. So my life is now his. I am to live his life. I am to do the things that he has called me to do. I am to live as Christ lived. And that is a major theme throughout the New Testament. And so Peter then lays out before us two very distinct responses to this cornerstone, this Jesus who came and sacrificed himself for us. You either reject it, ignore it, Stumble over it, it even says. And to stumble over it can even be to outright ignore it and reject it and say, no, that, that's not what the Messiah was supposed to be. Jesus is not supposed to be that way. Or even to discredit it in a way, or discredit the stone and say, well, you know, Jesus doesn't really want to take care of that part of my life. He's cool with it. We've got a special agreement. Everything's fine. Or even this idea of like, well, God still loves me and I know I'm messed up, but you know, this is the way I am. That's not what we are called to do. We are called to let every single area be touched by Christ. Or, so that's one response, is to let, reject it, stumble over it, discredit it, come up with, make up excuses. Or we can totally trust in it. And look at what it says, that we would never be put to shame. If we trust in it, we are never put to shame. And we would view this stone as absolutely precious. And so, even just a little bit of a, Going back to the craving of God's word, here's another piece of advice. Focus on the gospel and what Jesus has done for you. About God's incredible love for you. View Christ as precious because of what he has done and that makes the pages of this book stand out even more when you understand that. And so let's go to our, our, our last section we'll cover this morning. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is creating a contrast here between the fact that there were these builders who rejected Christ, who ignored him, like those one response I told you about, but instead, because we have viewed Christ as precious and we have trusted in him, we are now identified as God's chosen people. It's this incredible idea that, this is an Old Testament idea, that the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, were God's chosen people. They were also a royal priesthood, or as they said it in Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests. It's this incredible idea. It's this identity statement that this is who we are as the church. We are God's chosen people. We are God's special people chosen in, in order to bring glory and to do his incredible work. So that's our fourth directive is that we live as a kingdom of priests sent out to do the work of God. We are not simply here to be people who consume Jesus or simply just to attend uh, or, or to consume church, I mean, but, and not just to attend church on Sunday mornings, but to participate, to be an active member. Because look at what he says. This chosen people, this holy nation, this special possession, why were we chosen for this? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We don't simply get to rest back on this idea that now, okay, I have been saved by Jesus. Now I get to sit back and enjoy my life and let God take care of everybody else. No, our job as Christians, if we've put our faith in Christ, is to go out and declare his praises, to talk, to share the gospel with people, to go out and be representatives of Christ's kingdom wherever we go. It's this incredible concept that we have been able, that we have been given this idea to do his great works. And this goes back to the whole idea of this gospel. 
We have been saved not just to uh, enjoy it for ourselves, but to share it with the rest of the world, to declare his praises. We have been saved to do great works for God. And I want to encourage you with this. When he talks about the royal priesthood, again, it's this kingdom of priests idea. The idea that of what Israel was supposed to be was this kingdom of people who represented God to the rest of the world. And this was for every single individual person, not just for the select few, but for everyone. And so let me tell you, you are a representative of Jesus if you are a follower of him, wherever you go. And as such, we are to declare his great praises and also to do his work in the world. And so I want to I encourage you with something to to look for ways to step up, to look for ways for you to serve. And here's the thing is some of the things we could be doing, let me give you some examples of great works. First of all, you could be sharing the gospel with a neighbor or a friend to have the courage. And let me tell you, when God calls us to do something, it might be scary, but God also enables you to do it. That's what the point of the Holy Spirit is, to enable you, to encourage you, to give you the words to speak. Also, it's being generous with the gifts that God has given you, to be generous to the poor, to be caring and loving towards those in need. We could also be worshiping God as the only supreme being worthy of worship. We could be selfless in every single one of our relationships to look at everybody and say, your needs, your wants, your desires are more important than my own. Or lastly, we could find, we could serve in the church, outside the church, using the gifts that God has given us. See, here's the thing. The Bible basically, like the New Testament basically assumes that everybody is working and doing something. But here's the unfortunate reality of churches and what they're dealing with in our country, and our church is no exception. That a small group of people are doing the vast majority of the work. There are, there's a small group of people who are doing a vast majority of the work within the church. And this is a hard thing. And I think this is, I think this is where this comes from. Because I think in our culture, we have this mentality that there are what we call professional ministers. Okay. And so there are paid staff people who have been trained and have been raised up to lead the church. And so then they need to do all the work. And make sure you know this. This isn't just a plug to like, you know, so I don't have to do as much around here. Um, it's definitely not. Uh, it's, but, it's, but it's a calling to say, hey, we need to all be what God has called us to be, to be active members, to be involved all over the place so that we see that we never have to struggle for, to find volunteers. The volunteers just kind of are popping in and we can continue to do the work of God so that you can do the work of God and be a part of this incredible mission. But we have this mentality of the professional ministers and so we think, okay, they're doing the job, they've got it, I come to partake of the business of the church and then I get to go home. Like, and it's almost like a restaurant. I used that analogy earlier, but it's like a restaurant. We go, we eat the food, it's delicious, and then, or if it's bad, you write a nasty Yelp review, something like that, but then you, but then you go home and it's done. That's not, that's not what we're called to do. And again, when I say things like this, this is uh, something that looks me straight in the mirror, okay, that I look at and go, wow, yep, I need to be doing this more. I know of many places, many areas I could be doing this a lot better. But also, I want to remind you, this is what you have been designed for. You have been designed with a particular set of gifts. We'll talk about this more in depth in a couple weeks, but you have been designed with a particular set of gifts that God wants to use you for in order to further his kingdom. And they're to be used for that reason. They're not for you, for you to be, uh, enjoy it and to find so much joy and satisfaction in it, but, but also to serve the church and build it up so that it could be what it's called to be. And you can try things out, you know, so one of the specific areas that we definitely need right now is we need people to step up for children's ministry over the summer. We have spots where people, you know, or, you know, just one time, you could try it out. You could try it out and, you know, and it's okay for you to walk out and just go, <laughs> kids, <whistles> not for me. <laughs> oh, that, that was not my thing. That's okay. That's fine to say that, but you tried, you stepped up, you did something, and that's great. You could, and, and, and you know what? And maybe you might find that when you do it, you might try something that you never thought you would ever want to do and walk away going, oh, that was actually quite fun. That was quite awesome. I actually enjoyed that. I could see how God gifted me for this. I need to be doing this. And 
on that point, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Like 15, 16 years ago, if you'd have told me that this would be what I would be doing for a living, standing up in front of people talking, my parents are smiling right now <laughs> because they know this. I would have laughed at you in the face and said, no, I hate public speaking. Like I was the kid that would like hide in the back of the classrooms hoping the teacher wouldn't see me because I didn't want to do a speech. But this is what God has decided much against my own kicking and screaming probably 10, 15 years ago (laughs) that this is what he has called me to do. This is what I have gifted you for and he has enabled me to do it. So even though at first, you know, actually my first youth group lesson where I was in charge of a youth, youth ministry, I was the youth pastor. I walked into my, my senior pastor's office. He was very patient. I said, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I sucked. It was terrible. <laughs> I was so nervous. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. But he was patient. He said, well, let's just try it again. Let's just see what happens. Let, 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 let's see what God does. And eventually God gave me a passion and a desire to continue to do this. So God can give you a passion in an area and a desire to do something that you would have never thought of before. And so the question should never be, should I serve? You should always be serving, finding a way to get involved. And it should never be, do I have time? No, you, have to, you gotta find time. You gotta find the time. You gotta find something that maybe in your schedule you look at and you go, you know, that really is about me. That's not about doing something or building relationships with people in the community so that they can know Christ. This is about me and getting satisfaction for myself. I need to find time to carve out so that I can serve. Because I wanna show you, I wanna encourage you with a quote that I heard in high school that was so impactful for me uh, at this youth conference. It was by, it's by this guy named Stephen Argue. This is what he said. Church is not something I go to, but something I am. It's this beautiful idea. We don't, church is not a place we go to, but it's something that we are, that we are defined as, that this is who we are. We are a gathering of people who love Jesus, who want to serve him with our life, who worship him with our whole life. And so we want to do his great works. This is so, this is what we do. I, we represent Christ everywhere that we go. It is extremely important for us to understand because here's the thing. We live in a community that desperately needs Jesus. We live in a city that desperately needs Jesus. Portland is an area that is in dire need of the love of Jesus Christ. And so there is always something we can find to do in order for us to bring the message of hope of the gospel to our city, to let people know that there is hope beyond this world. And as Jesus even said himself, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So again, here's a few other areas. I mentioned the kids ministry, you could, you could sign up. And trust me, this wasn't a grand ploy in order to get you to sign up for that. That's just one e- expression. You could also help Liz in the kitchen. And you know, maybe you could be a taste tester for Liz in the kitchen. You could, <laughs> I know I'd want that job. Uh, <laughs> you could be a small group leader and help out with the youth group so that you can help our students follow Christ, disciple them, to help them learn. Hey, you could be an usher or greeter. If you feel really comfortable at like greeting people and being really friendly, go and do that. Sign up. We need people in that area too. Uh, and it's truly, if you see something in the church that you go, man, you know what? That, that area needs a little bit of help. Maybe the idea popped up in your head because you're the one who's supposed to do it. That's a scary thought. Trust me, that's a scary thought. But find a way, jump in, find places that maybe, and and say, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna step up, I'm gonna volunteer because this is, we are trying, this is my church and we are trying to build up the body so that we can serve Christ and declare his praises to our community and to our city. And so here's the concluding thought and summarize, to summarize everything that we've said. To be the royal priesthood of God, we cast aside our old selves, we crave his word, we have Christ as our foundation and we do his work to save this world. Let's pray. God, we're just so thankful for your word that exposes us and opens up our hearts, but God also encourages us. God enables us to do the work that you have called us to do. So God, we ask that you would stir in every single one of our hearts areas that we could serve, areas that we could be a part of God so that we can act out our identity as a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests who are 
uh, designed to do the works of God in our world. And so God, we thank you for this morning that we could worship you, we could sing praises to you, that we live in a country that's free and we could do that. And God, we, uh, we give this all to you and we pray this in your name, amen.